Uh, this is my 100th chapel as a chapel speaker at J. Woo! trying to do the math and then wondering why I got stuck on 99, but two years ago I had to miss one chapel to go home to do a funeral at my church, so I thought that last year I would get to do 100, but it ended up being this year, so I'm grateful for the privilege uh, of getting to do this. Uh, you know, so many years ago when I was a student on this campus, I would have never imagined or dreamed uh, that I would be a chapel speaker here. That was the furthest thing for my mind and expectation, but what God did in my life so many years ago, he's still working, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I want to ask you a question uh, as we begin this morning. Have you ever been in a situation that either looked or felt completely hopeless? Have you ever been there to say, I've been in a situation, or maybe you say, I'm there right now, where the situation that I'm in looks and feels completely hopeless. As we begin our journey with Moses this morning, we're going we're gonna to try to cover a, a bit of background on, on, on Moses and the Hebrew people, the Israelites living in Egypt, and we're going to see and discover that there is a lot of hopelessness. But even in the midst of the hopelessness that we'll see, we're going to see the unseen hand of God at work, and we're going to, I believe, discover some things at the end of Exodus chapter 2 that I think will, will really help us when we face hopelessness, because all of us, all of us will experience times where life feels or looks hopeless. So if you have your Bible, uh, we're going to be in Exodus chapter 1 and 2. Uh, we're not going to read every verse. We're going to uh, summarize some of it uh, for time's sake. But we're going to begin in Exodus chapter 1. And we're going to find there the, the background to the story and what, what is going on with the people of Israel as they're in Egypt. We're going to see the extraordinary circumstances of Moses' birth and early life. And then the narrative is going to jump quickly to his middle years of his middle life. And, and we're going to see Moses encounter a situation that leaves him hopeless. But we're going to see what God is doing in the midst of that. So Exodus chapter, chapter 1. And let's, let's begin together. I, I want you to have this thought in your mind. Is that God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Right? God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Right? He created you. He formed you and fashioned you. He made you in His image. If you know Jesus as your Savior, He has redeemed you. He has brought you into His family. He has adopted you as a child. Right? You are an heir of His kingdom and His glory. You are His beloved. You're His masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before and that you should walk in. And so I want you to have in your mind an understanding that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And He's going to call you to follow Him. And that's what God did in my life when I was here. He, he awakened me to realize that there was a purpose for my life and that He wanted me to follow Him. But following God sometimes is going to mean trusting Him when life is hopeless, or feels hopeless, or life is dark. And I want you to develop this week a confidence that you can trust Him and follow Him. So let's begin Exodus chapter 1. Uh, the first few verses gives us some, some background information about, about how we find the Hebrew people, the Israelites, living in Egypt. And it goes all the way back to when Joseph right, brought his family down to Egypt to escape the famine. And they ended up living there and dwelling there. And they, you know, Joseph has died and his descendants are multiplying. And it says in verse 7, the Israelites were fruitful. They increased rapidly and multiplied and became extremely numerous so that the land was filled with them. Verse 8, a new king who had not known Joseph came to power in Egypt. So there's a new pharaoh who, who just has no connection with, with Joseph. Remember, Joseph had become second in command of all of Egypt. He incurred much favor and goodwill with the pharaoh that he served under. And he said, uh, this new king says to the people of, of Egypt, he says, look, the Israelite people were more numerous and powerful than we are. Let us deal shrewdly with them. Otherwise, they will multiply further. And if war breaks out, they may join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So the Egyptians assigned taskmasters over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor. 
They built Pithom and Ramses and, as supply cities for Pharaoh. But the more they oppressed them, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. And so Pharaoh's original plan to, to uh, subjugate the Israelite people to forced labor and to heavy labor, to slow down their population growth and to control them, is backfiring and it's failing. Notice verse 13. It says, They worked the Israelites ruthlessly, and they made their lives bitter with difficult labor in brick and mortar and in all kinds of field work. They ruthlessly imposed all of this work on them. And so the oppression is getting worse and worse. For God's people, if they would have known the stories of their ancestors, the stories that Joseph would have passed down, the stories that his father Jacob had passed down, and Isaac and Abraham, the stories of a God who called Abraham out of Ur and promised him the land of Canaan. And Abraham followed God by faith. And they knew all these stories, but, but God didn't seem to be anywhere in their experience. He didn't seem to be working on their behalf. He didn't seem to be fulfilling his promises. And so there's hopelessness. It says in verse 15, Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one who was named Shipra and the other Pua, he says, When you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. And so Pharaoh decides to up his population control by, by destroying the male children. And so he gives this decree. But this also is going to backfire. Notice, what happens in verse 17, it says, The Hebrew midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. And so the Hebrew midwives, they choose to reverence God and trust God with this situation, even though they haven't seen God at work. Even though there's hopelessness, even though there's oppression, they know this is not right. We will not do this no matter what the cost. And so God is going to honor that and bless that. Verse 18, so the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this and let the boys live? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before a midwife can get to them. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very numerous. So it's pretty interesting that they answer him, and, and not only do they tell him, I think, what was true, but it's sort of a dig. Do you notice that? The Hebrew women are so strong that they give birth before we even get there to help them. Not like the Egyptian women. God honored their faith. Look at verse 21. So since the midwives feared God, he gave them families, which was very unusual. Verse 22. Pharaoh then commanded all of his people, you must throw every son born to the Hebrews into the Nile, but let every daughter live. And so he's like, if, if the midwives can't get it done, I'm going to give you all authority that if you see a Hebrew baby boy, you're to throw him in the Nile River and to kill him. So that is the, the setup now for chapter 2 as we're going to get into the story of Moses. And I know many of you are familiar with this story, right? It's, it's one of the stories that you probably learned early on, right, growing up. If you grew up in church at all, you know the story of Moses. And, and, and so I just want to walk through it quickly, uh, and then we're going to get to his, his midline. But look at verse chapter 2. Uh, verse 1, it says, Now a man from the family of Levi married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. And so this mom takes her son, and, and there's something within him that, that, that she notices. There, there's a beauty in him. And, and I believe this is a God-ordained thing. Like, this isn't just that he was a... Everybody thinks their baby's beautiful, right? Even your parents thought you were beautiful. Can you believe that? <laughs> Right, I, you know, when, when I saw Mike, you know, I, I remember before we had kids, you know, I'd see babies and people talk about how cute they are. I'm like, they look kind of weird, you know. <laughs> but then when you have your own, you're like, this is the most amazing, beautiful thing that I've ever seen, right? I, I uh, now my kids are 11 and 9, as I told you last night. I, I just checked my uh, my messages, and my they're staying with my parents this week. And my daughter messaged me last night, and she said, she said, I miss you more than you know. So, kind of got to my heart a little bit. But Moses' mother, she notices something. So she, by faith, she hides him. Verse 3, when she could no longer hide him, 
She got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with asphalt and pitch, and she placed the child in it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. So she, she has a plan. She has noticed something. She has noticed someone. And so as a mom who would do anything to protect her child, she has hatched a plan to save her son. And she puts him in this basket that is lined and protected to protect it from the water. And she places it on the edge of the river. And she doesn't just randomly go down to the river and sort of float him down the river and hope for the best. She's noticed that there's someone, someone powerful and important, Pharaoh's daughter, that comes to this section of the river. And so she is going to place him where he will be noticed. Verse 4, Then his sister stood at a distance in order to see what happened. So she positions Moses' older sister to watch. And Pharaoh's daughter went to the, down to bathe at the Nile while her servant girls were walking along the river bank. And seeing the basket among the reeds, she sent her slave girl to get it. When she opened it, she saw a, cry, a child, a little boy, crying. She felt sorry for him, and she said, This is one of the Hebrew boys. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Should I go and call a woman from the Hebrews to nurse the boy for you? Right? So his sister says, Hey, uh, suggestion, maybe I should get one of the Hebrew women to, to nurse this baby. And she says, That's a good idea. Verse 8, go. So the girl went, and she got Moses' mother. And then... She called him, and then Pharaoh's daughter said, Take this child and nurse him for me. I'll pay your wages. And so the woman took the boy and nursed him. And I believe what we see in this scene that is recorded for us in Scripture is that, that even in the midst of a hopeless time, and even in the midst when there was an evil man in charge who wanted to destroy innocent lives, that God's hand was at work. And that God was working out His purposes, even in the dark. And much as like in the stories of Esther and, and Ruth in the Old Testament, right, where in those stories we, we see so many times the unseen hand of God working on behalf of His people. And so God is at work, and so He allows Moses to be raised by his mother as a young child. He allows him to be nursed and taught and trained. But then he's going to have to be handed over to be raised as Pharaoh's grandson. Verse 10, when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. No doubt painful. She, became, she named him Moses. She says, because I drew him out of the water. But Moses, Moses, Moses' mother, Jochebed, she trusted God with her child. And so she places him, and there Moses is going to be raised as an Egyptian. But his Hebrew character and legacy was formed in him by his mother. And it says in verse 11 that years later, after, so now we're going to, now the narrative just skips ahead. We are now in Moses' middle life. He's around 40 years old. Years later, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his own people and he observed their forced labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And looking around and seeing no one, he struck the Egyptian dead and hid him in the sand. Now that word observed, right, where it says that Moses saw, he observed, it, it, did, it doesn't just mean that he, he literally saw with his eyes, but it's a word that conveys that he felt deep emotion. Right? Even though Moses has been raised as an Egyptian in Pharaoh's home, and Josephus, the historian, says that, that Moses led battles for Egypt, that he was actually potentially in line to become Pharaoh one day, but Moses knew his identity, and so even though he spoke Egyptian, and he had been educated as an Egyptian, and even though he lived the life of an Egyptian, he knew his identity. He knew that he was a Hebrew. He knew the stories that his mother had passed on to him as a young child. And so he goes out and he sees, he sees how his people are being treated, and it bothered him. It hurt him. He didn't like it. And so... He, he decides he's going to do something. Notice what the author of Hebrews says. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. It says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ, great, of the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to reward. 
And so the author of Hebrews is going to give us some insight into what might have been going on into Moses' mind. And something within Moses' mind is saying, God wants me to do something for my people. And God wants me to rescue my people somehow. Right? Somehow God wants me to rescue it. So in Moses' mind and heart, I believe that, that it was forming within his soul was a passion and a desire and a belief that he was going to be the deliverer of his people. That somehow, some way, he would do it. That he would be able to end the oppression that they were going through. And so Moses takes this moment, right, where he sees this Egyptian beating his fellow Hebrew. And he looks around, right, have you ever, have you ever done something that you knew you probably shouldn't do? Right, you don't have to, like, admit it, but I imagine, all right, a few honest people this morning, right? And, and a lot of times when we're going to do something we don't, we know we shouldn't do, we want to make sure we're not going to what? Get caught. Get caught, right? The most important thing to do when you're doing something you shouldn't do is what? Don't get caught. And so Moses looks around and he said, it looks good, the coast is clear, and he strikes this man and he kills him. And I really believe that Moses thought, this is going to cause my people to trust me. They're going to see that I'm willing to fight on their behalf. This will rally them to me and maybe set off God's plan. You know, so many times we might sense that God has a plan for our life or a calling our life, and then we try to force something or push something, and it doesn't work out. Notice Hebrews chapter 11. Or, no, actually, let me go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. A little more insight that God gives us in His Word in the New Testament about Moses. It says, Now when he was 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brother, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed. And so it, it says that, that Moses didn't just, you know, murder this man out of a, a cold heart, but it was out of a desire to protect and avenge the wrong, the suffering that he saw. And he struck down the Egyptian, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they didn't understand. And so Moses is thinking, this will show them that I'm with them, and that I'm for them, and they'll follow me. But notice what happened. Verse 13, back in Exodus chapter 2. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. And he asked the one in the wrong, Why are you attacking your neighbor? They said, Who made you a leader and a judge over us? Are you planning to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses became afraid and thought, What I did is certainly no. And even though they didn't have social media, and they didn't have phones, and they didn't have texting, words still traveled quickly. And so Moses becomes terrified of what is going to happen. And so it says that when Pharaoh heard about this, verse 15, so Pharaoh's scrolling through Insta stories, right? And he sees it, and he's like, what? So Pharaoh heard it, and he tries to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh, and he went to live in the land of Midian. Midian was a place that the Egyptians did not have have jurisdiction over at this time, so they could not extradite Moses, if you will, and bring him back. And so he goes to a place where he escapes the hand of Egypt. And it says that he came to draw water and filled the troughs. To, uh, oh, he, he goes to Midian and he sits to Midian and he sits down by a well. I got ahead of myself. I'm looking at the clock and I know I got to go quick. So he gets down to Midian and then he sees these these lady shepherdesses that come out and they get harassed and attacked and Moses runs off the attackers and he feeds and waters these, the flock and they go home and they tell their dad and dad's like, how did you guys get home so early? And they're like, well, this Egyptian guy came and he ran off the people that were trying to, to attack us and he fed and watered our flock. And then their dad was like, well, where is he? Like, you didn't invite him back for dinner or anything? And they're like, no, we just left him there. So we go get him, and so he comes back for dinner. Long story short, this man likes Moses. He says, why don't you marry one of my daughters? Right? And Moses marries one of his daughters, and he begins a new life there in Midian. He becomes a shepherd. And for Moses, I really think that his life has become hopeless in a sense. That the dream, the belief that, that he was going to be the deliverer and the rescue of his people has died. Right, that, that dream has died. That hope has died. 
And now he's just a shepherd in the middle of nowhere. Look at verse 22. This is after he is married. It says, She gave birth, his wife, to a son, and he named him Gershom. For he said, I have become a stranger in a foreign land. Right? His, son, his son's name literally meant stranger. And so Moses' hope, right? his hope of seeing his family, his hope of fulfilling the purpose that God had for him, the hope of, of being who God called him to be, is gone. But then notice these last few verses. And, and this is where I really want to focus our attention. He says, verse 23 says, After a long time, the king of Egypt died. After a long time. You know, I, I get impatient sometimes. Anybody else get impatient? Right? We want things to happen what? Right away. Right? We wait, you know, we, we, we get so impatient. But God works in time. And he works through time. God exists over time. He's not limited by time. But he works in and through time. And so it says, after a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor. They cried out. And their cry for help ascended to God because of their difficult labor. And so we see here that the, the, their, their life is getting worse and worse. And in their desperation, they're crying out to God. And it says that God heard their cry. Look at verse 24. So God heard their groaning. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, if we just read this sort of casually, we might think, did God forget like, what, is, what does it mean that he remembered? Like, did, oh, did God look down and be like, oh, yes, 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 yes. How could I have been so foolish? I, I made a promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. I, what have I been doing? We, we might be tempted to think that, right? As we look at that word. But this word remembered, it, it, it means covenant faithfulness. It means taking action in order to fulfill a covenant. It's a signal where God has not forgotten God hasn't forgotten at all. In fact, in the dark and in the waiting, God has been working His plan and His purposes for His people. And ultimately, He's working His plan and purpose for His people because it's through these people that He plans to bring His ultimate solution for the rebellion of mankind, the sin of mankind into the world, His Son Jesus. And so God remembers, not in the sense of that He forgot, but in the sense of he's acting on behalf of his covenant in his time. Notice verse 25. God saw the Israelites and he took notice. God saw the Israelites and he took notice. Many times in life, on our journey, life will feel and look hopeless. Right? I have been there. Right? I have been in those moments where everything looked and felt hopeless. But I can tell you with confidence and assurance that even in those moments where life looks and feels hopeless, God has not forgotten you. And God has not forgotten His covenant promises. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have a relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ, you are in a covenant relationship with God. A covenant that God ratified and sealed with the very blood of His Son who was willing to offer himself as a sacrifice for your sin and your rebellion, for my sin and my rebellion. And he did all of that because he loves you, right? And he loves me for God so what? Loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God has offered you a covenant. And all is required of you is to come to him in faith and in belief and to give your life to him and to trust what he has done for you and to follow him. And so, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you have entered that relationship, God is on His throne, He is at work, and He hears you, and He sees you. And following God with your life is going to require us to trust Him when life is hopeless. So, I just want to give you a couple things to hang on to when life looks and feels hopeless. Number one, remember that God is at work. Remember that God is at work, so look for His hand. Right, the unseen hand of God was all over the story and life of Moses. And I believe this story is all over yours. I look back on times that I couldn't see or feel God in my life, but I can look back and say he was working. Right, he was working so clearly and so evidently. I might not have been able to see it, feel it, or perceive it at the moment, but that doesn't mean he wasn't working. So look for his hand. Look for his provision, his protection in your life. 
Number two, God hears you. God hears you. And so call out to Him. Right? There, you know, there is never a time that God does not listen to the prayers of His children. And He hears you. You know, you know I, I literally looked at my phone this morning. I went to Facebook Messenger, because that's how my daughter messages me, through Facebook Kids Messenger. And I, I wanted to see if she had sent me a message. And she had. And I wanted to hear from her, because she's my daughter, and I'm her dad, and I love her. And your Heavenly Father loves you with a love that's far greater and far deeper than the love that I have for my daughter and my son. And he loves to hear from you. So call out to him. Tell him, I feel hopeless. I don't know what to do. God, I'm tempted even to be angry with you. I don't understand. This is, ups, this is hard. It's difficult. It's painful. I don't like this. God, what are you doing? Pour out your heart to God. He will listen and he will hear you. Number three, God remembers. God remembers to trust his promises. Right? God has or, ordained that we would have to walk by faith and not by sight. And that sounds really exciting, but it's not always as easy as it sounds, is it? You know, I went through a really difficult transition in ministry seven years ago, and, and it was a very hard time for me and for our family. And, and I remember having lunch with a friend of mine, and I, I said to him, I said, you know, I've talked about faith, and I have faith, and living by faith is, is the way God wants us to live. But you know what? I said, walking by sight is a whole lot easier and a whole lot more comfortable. But God hasn't called us to walk by sight by faith. And so in those times, he wants you to trust his promises. And you can always run back to the cross and say, I don't understand what God's doing now. This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But God so loved the world that he gave his son. Jesus died for me. He willingly went to the cross. He suffered in my place. And he's redeemed me and called me by name. And he knows me and he loves me. And he's called me to be with him forever. And so I'm going to trust his promises. And number four, remember that God sees you. God sees you. And he's brought you here to this place, I believe, for a great purpose. I don't believe it's an accident that we are gathered here together in this week. And I believe he's brought you here that you might know him in a way that you've never known him before. I believe he's brought you here to give you confidence and trust in who he is and his power. I believe he's been here to grow you as a musician, to stretch you. Right? To take the talents and gifts and abilities that he has blessed you with and grow them and develop them for his kingdom and for his glory. And I believe that he wants you to leave here with a greater sense of his purpose and calling on your life. But I know that there will be times that life will feel hopeless. And it's easy when we're at camp right, to say, yes, I believe that. That's great. I have a purpose for my life. I'm going to live for it. And then we go home and we go into the valley and we go through the difficulty and the pain and the suffering and the... The, the darkness that, that life sometimes brings, and sometimes then we forget. And so I want you to remember these things. Remember that God's at work. Remember He hears you. Remember that He remembers you. And most importantly, that He sees you. Right? God sees you, and He cares, and He loves you, and He wants to work in your life. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for uh, the privilege of, of getting to be here uh, back at Shehi. Father, I just thank you so much for your grace that, that, that we could have camped this summer. And Father, I just pray uh, that as we journey through your word uh, this week in, in Exodus, that you would teach us and grow us. I thank you that your word is living and powerful and true. And Father, I pray that, that you would help us and help me, help all of us to, to rediscover your purpose and plan for our lives and to help us to have the confidence and faith to follow you. But I just pray right now for anyone who is struggling with feeling hopeless. Maybe it's a situation at home, a situation in their life, a struggle that they're dealing with. Father, maybe it's depression or anxiety. Maybe it's a family situation. I don't know what it is, but Father, I pray that you would minister to your children right now. Your grace and your mercy and your compassion and your love. I pray that they would know the tenderness of your comfort and the power of your strength and the sufficiency of your grace. And that you would give them the faith to trust you in the dark. And that they would see your hand at work in their lives. Father, I ask your blessing over this day as we go out to uh, an exciting day of, of, of jumping into rehearsals and lessons, practice and hard work. That you would bless this day and uh, that we would see your hand. And we love you. We praise you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.